All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be reviewing two books in one. Yes, two for the price of one. Because I just consider this duology to be just one big, long, epic fantasy novel split into two parts. And that is <clears throat> Stephen Donaldson's Mirror of Her Dreams and A Man Rides Through, books one and two of the More Dance Need duology. Now this, my friends, is my favorite Stephen R. Donaldson book series of all time. And I love Stephen R. Donaldson books. I've got all of his books. Let's see, they're right up here. Got a little group of them there and then a bunch of them over there. One of my favorite fantasy authors of all time and sci-fi authors. He's done some of my favorite series in both fantasy and science fiction. But anyway, we are talking about these two books today. They came out in 1986. So a long, long time ago, um, back when I was a kid, and I got the uh, hard covers here. So let's talk about the covers and the graphic design. You know I love graphic design and cover illustration. So let's talk about that first, because I've got the hardcover versions up here and the paperbacks, and we will compare and contrast so this is the hardcover version of Mirror of Her Dreams. It's got the wonderful Michael Whalen painting. Um, great font, great design, a nice wraparound look with the picture of the author on the back. Looks like a dude that was probably walking around in the 1986s. Yeah, and then we've got um, the paperback version. So then the little uh, mass market paperback version came out. I mean, it's similar. They just zoomed in. Like, this is a more of a... You know, they zoomed in on the girl looking in the mirror, and um, the it's like I like I like the fact that it's silver. I like that. So that is um, cover design for book one. Another great Michael Whalen painting. Mirrors, of course, are the theme throughout this book. Same, similar font, wrap around. Oh, no picture of the author. Well, that's surprising and shocking, but together the hardcovers look cool. They look like they belong together. Spine out, they look like they work together as a couple of books, and they're thick books. I mean, each one of these books is about 700 pages. So if you were to um, print it in one book, yeah, it would have been like 1,400 pages. So I, I can see why they split it up. I mean, hell, they might as well have just made it a trilogy, to be honest, because... There's really no breaking. I mean, they could have split that up into three. Whatever. Anyway, what's done is done. We can't go back into history and ask the publisher to do anything like that. Let's talk about the paperbacks, though. Like, um, book number two paperback. Like, here we go. And then we've got, uh, we've zoomed in. Well, I guess we haven't really zoomed in too much, but the, the, uh, Font and stuff is kind of covering the illustration a little bit, but you know, it's gold this time. It's got a gold theme So uh, let's see here what we've got is The silver themed book the gold theme booked put them together on the shelf. They look nice Cool, I mean I can't complain about any of that. So let us talk about the book itself 1986 oh no, let's back up a moment and talk about the aesthetics of the book because I have the only book that I have met Stephen Donaldson two or three different times. The only time he ever signed my books was when I happened to have these along with me. So I do have signed copies of these. Don't have anything else of mine signed by him, but I did have him sign my favorite series. Anyway, okay, almost forgot. Let's talk about these two books, and uh, the, like I said, I think it, I consider it just to be one big novel broke up into two pieces. Um, 1986, this was, and I will be honest with you, this was the first sort of adult fantasy series 
that really sort of um, made me stand up and take notice of, oh my gosh, fantasy can be different than elves, dwarves, dragons, dragonlance, um, you know, Shannara, David Eddings, Raymond Feist, uh, you know, all those, all those books that I loved and read as a kid, as a kid, they um, were kind of um, geared toward that high fantasy side. This was the first, these, this was the first series in 86 that came along that when I read it, I was like, this is seriously unlike anything in the fantasy genre that I've read before in that it's kind of like just really serious political intrigue based fantasy, sort of in the vein of Game of Thrones, where people are just vying for the throne. There's no big quest. There's no big, there's no magic talism talismans that are going to save the world. There's no um, orphan farm boys prophesied to save the world. There's no dark lord that needs to be fought. And it seemed like all the other fantasies, there's no dragons. Uh, there's no real high magic that, to speak of. There's no elves and dwarves. Um, in fact, this, um, and we're going to compare and contrast this series a little bit to Thomas Covenant. Um, but this was the first series where I was like, this is like actual political intrigue based in a fantasy world. And I was digging it as a kid. I was digging it. And up to, and, and once I read this, these suddenly vaulted themselves back in 1986 when I was younger into the top, my favorite fantasy book of all time. And then a few years later, uh, Tad Williams' Dragonbone Chair came out, which is back here. And that and that usurped these books as my favorite. And then, you know, then we and a few years after that, we get the Game of Thrones and, and everything kind of snowballed into a, more of a grim, dark type of fantasy landscape after that. But this really was the first stuff I read that really I would have considered sort of low fantasy, grim, dark, light, like light on the magic heavy on the political intrigue type stuff. And I liked it. And then, and, and the landscape that we're traveling through wasn't like any of the landscapes I'd traveled through before in fantasy worlds where everything was so grand and grandiose and big, huge landscapes, like big cities like Minas Tirith. And, and even in Stephen Donaldson's uh, Thomas Covenant series, the land that we're traveling through just seems to be ultra magical and all the creatures just to, seem to be just like, um, you know, it was like imagination on steroids. And this series was really dialed back on that. This was like, um, this was like regular people in regular old stone castles, um, just sort of eking out kind of a living in a very, um, uh, you know, it, it, you know, there were no Galadriels and forests of, you know, Lothlorien and, um, there were no, uh, misty mountains and there were no, like, even in Shannara, we had like the larger than life landscapes and the Thomas Covenant original Stephen Donaldson's book says the landscape was just larger than life and it was so beautiful and it seemed like it was worth saving you know it's like Middle Earth seems like it's a place that's worth saving you know David Edding's Belgariad series like seems like it's a landscape worth saving um Thomas Thomas Covenant's when he that area it seemed like a place that was worth saving because everything was so beautiful and everything here everything's so grim it's like does it need to be saved? Like, really? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't it be better off to just wipe it out and start anew? So anyway, that's kind of what I, I was, it was like my first foray into this type of fantasy, really. Um, so then we, oh, so let's, what it's about. That's like a broad sense of what it's about. Landscape, world building. Character wise, we get Teresa, Teresa Morgan. This is a portal fantasy. Just like Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever took Thomas Covenant, a, a guy from our day and age, into a fantasy world. Stephen R. Donaldson does the same trope again with Teresa Morgan. She's a normal girl living in Manhattan. In fact, she's kind of like a pampered rich girl living in Manhattan. And she um, she uh, is looking through her mirror. A, a guy steps out of her mirror. A, a guy dressed like in a Renaissance fair outfit steps out of her mirror convinces her to step into the mirror. Um, he says that she could uh, help him 
in his uh, like fantasy world. He's he's got to he's like what's called an imager. And imagers work with mirrors. They can they can conjure things up in the mirror. The things that are seen in the mirror are real. Um, and he has he's one of these imagers, and he's been tasked with finding a savior for their realm through these mirrors. And um, so he steps into the mirror, pulls her out of New York City into his land which is Mordant, the land of Mordant. And as soon as she, as soon as Teresa from New York City gets pulled into this land, she realizes right away that it's grim, uh, it's medieval, uh, people are conniving, and there's the throne that everybody wants to get, and different people are warring with each other. It's your typical Game of Thrones type scenario where everybody wants power. And the magic that there is is limited to these mirrors and what you can pull in and out of the mirrors and things like that. The actual savior for the land, because Garadan pulls this girl, and Garadan's a young man about Teresa's age. Teresa's is probably in her young, early 20s, or, and, and, and Garadan is too, and he pulls her into this land. And all the other people that are expecting him to pull a savior because she that's the prophecy a savior is going to come out of the mirror and and but the savior that they're waiting for because one of the mirrors they've got is of this crazy like terminator guy from science fiction world then they can look into this mirror and they can see him and he's just got battle armor and laser blaster guns and he's just take kicking ass and taking names in this mirror and that's who they were expecting Garadin to go into the mirror and pull this guy out, and he would be the one that saves them. And, um, well, he comes with a girl, you know, and they're just like, but then that whole thing turns into, um, you know, she meets all these different players in this castle that are, all have different motives, all have different political ideals, all are stabbing each other in the back and betraying each other. It's like Game of Thrones, but just concentrated into this one castle. You got Master Aramis, who just seems to be our antagonist throughout the whole thing. And he is just this slick, cunning dude. We've got Barsonage and Gilbor. They are part of the congery of people that are uh, hoping to pull people out of the mirror to save them. Um, um, they're all skeptical people. Um, Ardigan, the uh, brother of... Uh, I mean, there's, there's the king and the jester. And you'd never know what's going on with the king and the jester. It just seems like so much mystery and intrigue Teresa has stumbled into. King Joyce, um, uh, Adept Hagalock, Havelock, probably my two favorite characters because they seem to be bumbling fools, but at the same time they seem to be um, kind of running things. And I won't give it away any more than that, but it happens to just revolve around this kingdom that needs to be saved from all the other kingdoms that are trying to take it over and the only way that they can be saved is if they pull a hero out of these mirrors and it seems like they've pulled the wrong seems like the garadin has done pulled the wrong person in teresa but maybe she is the right person that's the whole thing there's a whole mystery so many layers of plot and mystery to rival game of thrones are packed into this it's just when I was a kid, I was just, I hadn't read anything like it. I was just like, this is, this is, I was a kid and I'm like, this is what adults should be reading. I am now an adult. I am now a man because I've read these. And, uh, I used, I read these probably over and over as a kid, probably five or six times, read them so much that I even thought that it should be a movie. And if it was made into a movie, it would be the greatest movie of all time. And I'd even, every single character in the books I had like, picked an actor out that would be perfect for it like you know, this was when johnny depp was just getting new in um hollywood and i'm like man he would make the perfect garrett and you know the young dude that pulls the girl out of the thing and i was like who would be the great who would be the perfect and i had all these different actresses that were in their early 20s or late teens that i thought would be the perfect perfect person to pay, play Teresa. and i had like robert de niro was gonna play like Master Aramis and and uh, Sean Connery was gonna be in it and and uh, and I liked uh, I think it was Kevin Costner who had just been in Field of Dreams or something around 1987 maybe that's 80 maybe I think he was in Silverado and I was like that would be one of the that would be a cool guy to be the sword fighter and so I had I had plotted out all the actors and actresses that would play all the different parts in this 
It's just one of the very formative fantasy series that I read as a kid. And I know it ranked pretty high on my top 40 fantasy series of all time list. But anyway, um, a little bit longer of a review this time because we're talking about two different books here. And I just reread them uh, this winter. Perfect type of books to read in the winter time because it seems like every single scene in these books just takes place in a cold wintry castle that you just would not want to live in and uh so anyway tens out of tens for these battles galore towards the end of book two um intrigue galore throughout the both of them betrayals never knowing who's on the up and up never knowing which character is really the good guy the bad guy all of that stuff absolutely delightful um adult fantasy 10 out of 10